continue our study of the Sermon on the Mount. So if you have your Bibles, please take it and look with me in Matthew chapter 5 as we continue through this passage of Scripture together. Matthew chapter 5. I know last week we, we started out, we took a look at the Beatitudes found in the first uh, 12 verses of Matthew chapter 5. And then today we're going to look at verses 13 through 16 where uh, Jesus talks about being salt and light. So last week we went through the Beatitudes and I just want to call your attention just in way of uh, setting up today's message. Back in verse 10 of Matthew 5 it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then in verse 11, it says, blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. So verse 10 talks about righteousness sake. Verse 11 talks about for Jesus sake. Well, those are synonymous because Jesus is known as the righteous one in the Bible. And the righteousness that we need to stand before the Lord and enter heaven is the righteousness of Christ. Um, he is the Christian's righteousness. Without the righteousness of Christ in our lives, we don't have any righteousness that suffices in the eyes of Almighty God. Self-righteousness does not commend us to God. It only condemns us before God because while we might appear righteous when we compare ourselves to others, compared to the righteous standard of God, which is absolute perfection and holiness, we are unrighteous. We have sinned. We fall short of the glory of God. It's like someone who might be driving along and they see a pasture and out in that green pasture, they see these beautiful white sheep up against the backdrop of that green pasture and they think, how beautiful and white are those sheep against that green pasture? But then it snows and as the snow falls and lays on the, on the ground and they see those sheep out there, they say how brown those sheep look against the backdrop of the white snow. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, it depends on what you compare yourself to as to how righteous you might think you are. But when we compare ourselves to the ultimate standard, which is the Lord God, who said, be holy, for I am holy, we fall far short. Now, we, you know, we might say, well, compared to Hitler, I'm pretty good. Well, yeah, probably so. But the standard isn't Hitler or Stalin or Mussolini or Hussein or whoever you want to put out there. The standard is Jesus. And so those who live the life of the Beatitudes are who are, and, and are, the, are, are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake and Jesus sake are referred to in today's passage as salt and light. And one of the reasons Christians are persecuted is because they refuse to live like the world. The world likes people who will join in, who will go along, who will make them feel good about where they are or what they believe. But Christians reject the values, the priorities, and the schemes of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And rather than reflect the world, Christians strive to influence the world. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. But sadly, today, the church is more influenced by the world than the world is influenced by the church. And that's a problem. And if we really belong to Jesus, if we're really beatitude people, we are salt and light to society. That's what we're going to see here in the next few verses. When we live the life of the Beatitudes, some people will respond favorably and be saved, whereas others will ridicule and persecute us. So let's look at these 
verses in Matthew 5, 13 through 16. The Bible says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The world needs salt because the world is corrupt. And the world needs light because it, the world is dark. The biblical worldview is that the world is corrupted and decayed and that it is dark and it's getting dark. The world cannot do anything but get worse because it has no inherent goodness to build upon, no inherent spiritual or moral life in which it can grow. And we all know, according to scripture, that humanity is infected with the deadly virus of sin. And sin has no cure apart from God. And unlike their attitude toward physical diseases, most men do not want their sin cured. They love their sin and they hate God's righteousness. That's what Jesus said in John 3, 19 and 20. Jesus said these words, this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come into the light lest his deeds should be exposed. So when we come to these verses, what Jesus is teaching in these verses literally is that you are the only salt of the earth. You are the only light of the world. The very ones who are persecuted by the world and despised by the world are the world's only hope. We are God's salt to retard corruption and we are his light to reveal truth. So let's take a minute and look up at salt. Now, Try to track with me if you can. By definition, an influence must be different from that which it influences. So Christians, therefore, if we're to be influencers, must be different from the world that we're called to influence. We cannot influence the world for God when we are worldly ourselves. We cannot give light to the world if we revert to places and ways of darkness ourselves. Now in Jesus' day, salt was a very valuable commodity. His disciples understood this and also understood that they were to have an extremely important function in the world. Salt always stood for that which was of high value and importance. Sometimes Roman soldiers were even paid in salt. That's where we get the phrase, he's not worth his salt. That's where that comes from. Now, some think that Jesus here used the example of salt because it flavors, and it certainly does flavor. But the idea is that Jesus used it with regard to flavor because Christians are to make the message of the gospel appealing and desirable. But the problem with that view is that from the earliest days of the church, the world has considered Christianity to be anything but attractive and flavorful. It has in fact often found the most spiritual Christians to be the most unpalatable people. And in the world's eyes, Christians above most others take the flavor out of life christianity to a lot of people christianity is a stifling it is restrictive and it rains on the world's parade and that's why most people don't like it most people aren't interested in it and why some will actually persecute those who preach teach and share the gospel so rather than consider salt for its flavoring qualities 
There are two things that I think Jesus is hinting at here that we should consider salt as. And we should look at it, first of all, as a healer. Salt heals. And we should look at it as a preservative. Now, have you ever had salt go into a wound? It can sting, right? It hurts sometimes. Well, the message of the gospel is offensive to those who are perishing, the Bible says. It, it can hurt. In fact, being convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment can hurt. It can sting. We don't like that. People don't like hearing they're not good enough to go to heaven. People don't like to be wrong. People can be very proud. But the gospel and the accompanying work of the Holy Spirit is spiritual surgery. The Bible likens the word of God to a double-edged sword, a scalpel, if you will. And sometimes gospel work can hurt people like a scalpel because they realize they have a disease called sin and they need to be have that taken care of. But just like a scalpel in a surgeon's hand, if used correctly, can help a person heal, it can, it can do that when someone shares the gospel, God can use the gospel to help someone come to Christ and be saved. So when you submit to the Lord's corrective surgery, the Bible says you receive a new heart, new desires, a new life, and a new purpose. And along with that, you get all the blessings of forgiveness, hope, healing, and peace with God. So let's not be so concerned with not offending others that we fail to confront them with their lostness and their need to be saved from sin. A gospel that does not confront sin does not, it is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus didn't say we are the sugar of the world. He said we're the salt. And salt can irritate sometimes. Now, the world is radically opposed to that which will save them. Not all will reject the gospel, however. We don't know who will receive it and be saved and who will reject it and not be. But we do know that if we don't share the gospel, nobody will be. So we need to share the gospel. The gospel can heal. But also the, God, the, the, the function of salt is that Jesus, uh, that Jesus may have had in mind was preservation. Christians are a preserving influence in the world. We retard moral and spiritual spoilage, if you will. And I think there are two important things we need to understand about being the salt of the earth. One is that we just need to be in touch with our culture. If you keep salt in the salt shaker and never use it for what it's for, it's wasted and useless and cannot fulfill its purpose. So we need to be in touch with our culture. I'm not saying we need to mimic it, but we need to certainly engage with it. Number two, we need to retain our distinctiveness. Our distinctiveness. If we lose our unique Christian qualities and become like society, then we won't have any impact for Christ. If we're just like everyone else, nothing stands out. You know, we're, we're not different. We become the problem instead of the solution. So we need to be distinctively Christian in the way we live. And I would tell you this too, because Jesus said, if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Salt can lose its saltiness. Christians can lose their effectiveness in the kingdom when sin and worldliness contaminate their lives, just as salt can become tasteless when it's contaminated by other minerals. It is a common New Testament truth that although true believers are identified as righteous and godly and salty, there are times when they fail to be those things. 
and that can lead to the loss of assurance but not ultimately to the loss of salvation. Now, let me look at the question of being light, the light of the world. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do you light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So Jesus calls us to be light. He says, you, disciples, are the light of the world. Whereas salt is kind of hidden, right? When you cook with salt, it kind of blends in to the food. I mean, if you can see it on top, you probably don't want to eat it. Probably too much, unless it's a candy bar. Then, and some of those, they're pretty good. But salt is hidden usually, but light is not. Light is obvious. Salt works secretly while light works openly. So Jesus says we're both of those things. Salt works from within and light works from without. Salt is more the indirect influence of the gospel and light is more of the direct part, the direct communication of the gospel. Salt works primarily through our living while light works primarily through what we preach, teach, and say. And so there are at least two things you need to know about light. One is you can't miss it. I mean, look, there's light all over the place in here. We, we, you can't miss light. When there's light, you can't miss it. We cannot reflect the light of Christ and remain obscured. If you're shining the light of Christ, it's going to be obvious. It is biblically impossible for it to be hidden if you're shining the light of Christ. There are, we, we are not to be secret Christians, private Christians. We're to be open and out there. So you can't miss it. And then number two, we're to use that light to help people see. You don't get a lamp just so you can cover it up doesn't make sense. Why would you even have one? The lamp has a purpose. Otherwise, what's the point? Well, listen to these verses from Scripture. 1 John 5, 1 through 7. 1 John 1, 5 through 7, I'm sorry. says, this is the message which we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen, Amen to that. And then that verse from Psalm 119, verse 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto what? My path. That's right. So God's light is to walk by and to live by. And in its fullest sense, God's light is the revelation of his word, the written word of scripture and the living word of Jesus Christ. Even Jesus himself claimed to be the light of the world. And as Christians, we are the light of the world as we share Jesus through our lives and through our lips. Amen. Christ is the true light and we are his reflections. God sheds his light upon the world through those who have received his light through Jesus Christ. Listen to what Paul wrote in Philippians 2. 14 through 16. Paul says this, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. 
That's, that's what we're supposed to be. That's what Paul says we are. So by its nature and by definition, light must be visible in order to illuminate. And Christians must be more than largely the indirect influence like salt is. We must also be direct and noticeable instruments of light. You see, darkness gets darker because the light fails. Darkness is simply the absence of light. It's the nature of darkness to be dark. But it's the nature of light to overcome darkness. You can take a light into a dark room and light it up. But you know what you can't do? You cannot bring darkness into a lighted room and make it dark. It doesn't work that way. Darkness rules only when the light does not shine. So let's look at verse 16 and we'll wrap this thing up. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify you. Is that what it said? What does it say? Who are they going to glorify? The Father in heaven. That's right. So it's not about us. It's about him. People who live in the light are not conscious of their own light. We don't have any light of our own. It all comes from God. We are reflections of his light. Like the moon has no light of its own. It is only visible when it's reflecting the light of the sun. Well, Christians have no light of our own and our light is only visible when we reflect the light of the Son of God. People who only reflect light don't brag about how bright they are. They know it's not of their own doing, it's God's doing. There are no thousand watt beatitude people. Beatitude people are more conscious of their own darkness, of his grace and of his light than they are of how much light they reflect. But they shine as they reflect the Lord and many who see them find their way to God, amen. So the Bible tells us as Christians, we've been created unto good works. Works are not the root of our salvation, but they are the fruit of our salvation. And true faith in the Lord Jesus results in good works that glorify God. That's what Jesus is telling us right here. Our light should so shine before men that they see our good works and glorify God. We should be a redirector. They look at us, they see it, and we point them to God. Amen. Amen. If your life is about you, and you getting the credit and the recognition, you've got it wrong. God does not exist to glorify you. It's not all about you, it's about him and what he can do and what he will do through those who trust in him. So let's consider how we might be better uh, salt and light in this dark and dying world.